so without further ado, let's get started. So today um, we're, we're going to be talking about um, getting out of the daily chaos in your business. Um, if your business is using EOS and if you're just curious about using EOS, we'll talk a bit more about what that is. And if things are getting a bit overwhelming, it's a lot when your business is either not growing or when it's growing. If you need a break, you know, we can give you some tips and tools and techniques for people who are self-implementing or self-integrating EOS and not living a lifestyle that you feel like you deserve. Um, my name is D. Ray Freeman. I'm here with Tiffany Apolola. Tiffany, would you like to introduce yourself first? Oh, sure. Uh Great to be here, and uh, thank you for asking me to do this with you, Ray. So I'm an EOS implementer, lawyer, entrepreneur, Colby certified consultant, and um, active board member. So I love talking about all of those things and look forward to uh, sharing some info and questions from you today. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm D. Ray Freeman, an EOS integrator, published author, and expert in digital and org transformation at scale. I work with a lot of big companies uh, from oil and gas to uh, financial services to manufacturing, um, all in helping them to scale operations and shape new opportunities in their organizations. And to connect with either of, either of us, we have a, a couple of QR codes here and some ways that you can reach us for more details. So moving forward, this webinar, this is what we're in today, is designed for people who are curious about EOS or are self-implementing today and perhaps feeling a bit overwhelmed where you are today. Um, what you're gonna get out of this is some tools, tips, and techniques that are gonna help you get out of chaos or stagnation or feeling frustrated um, can probably help you solve some challenges that are on your plate today. And this is going to give you ways to maximize your EOS investment. So first, Tiffany, tell us a bit about what is EOS and just kind of give us a, a brief overview of the model and the, the process that we're even talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, is anyone here completely new to EOS? don't know what it's about at all let me know in the chat <laughs> well if someone doesn't know anything about it this will give you a really good overview uh in in one minute basically and it, it goes pretty in depth uh the more you read into it and look into it but there's a model and there's a process that's the big idea and the model has six key components vision people data issues process and traction. And in the middle of that is your business. And as most businesses have all of these things in common. And typically, if you have an issue uh, or an area that's holding you up, it'll probably fall within one of these buckets. So that's the big idea about the model. And within each component, there are two main questions or areas that we talk about within EOS, which is a holistic uh, operating system for a business. And vision is about eight questions and having the same understanding shared by everyone in the organization. People, right person in the right seat, the idea of having the right pe people on the bus. And data, scorecard plus measurables together are you tracking the right things? And are you looking at it frequently? Issues is having an issues list and working through it in an effective way with IDS. Process is documenting your key core processes and making sure they're followed by all. And then last but not least is traction uh, or accountability. So rocks, which are goals, and then a meeting pulse that's regular. So within all of that, there's a process and how companies journey through uh, EOS and how they build strength and mastery in these components. So that's the process overall. And typically it's foundational sessions that are three and then teams meet quarterly to move along in the EOS journey. So that's the really high level overview. Very cool, Sharon, Tiffany. You know, someone asked me once, you know, when does EOS not work? Or is there, is there chances when it just doesn't work? 
And you know, the basic answer is when you don't do it. Like the, the things that were just covered are crucial elements of the business. And what I've seen sometimes is that organizations will start doing good things and will start to slack off on them. Well, we don't set goals anymore. Well, we don't do planning. We don't keep scorecards anymore. And the dreaded one, this last one, we give this person a pass because he's my cousin or spouse or sister or brother. Um, not doing what's best for the business, but what's doing uh, what you think is best for your, yourself or for that person. Um, these are things that we see that are detrimental to the, the business. Yeah, absolutely. And that those are very common things. Or um, another big one I would add is that when it doesn't work is when um, you're not all in on it. So um, when you do anything and just kind of dipping your toe in the water and not really committed to it, it's setting itself up for, for not working. Good point. So Tiffany, what if what if someone is having these kind of, of issues? Can you take us through some of these that are on the screen and you know what happens when you're having these kind of issues? Yeah, so oftentimes uh, teams will have problems as in they're not on the same page. Mm -hmm. And it could be that the vision is not clear. There's a couple reasons that could be. Maybe it's just in one person's head and it hasn't been translated to paper. Uh, the leadership team may not be aligned on the goals or how they're going to get there or even core values. And it can cause a lot of disruption to the day-to-day -day and misalignment. Uh, after that, we have not growing. So maybe the business has plateaued or you're struggling to get to the next level of the organization and you just can't figure out why. On, on the inverse of that, it's you're growing, you've grown so much and faster than expected, but the perhaps the people on the team aren't going to be the ones who take you to the next level or you realize uh, maybe they've outgrown the organization or the organization just has different needs now. And then uh, infighting is another big one where if the leadership team is not healthy, then most likely the rest of the organization is not either. So that's a really high level of real of uh, what problems you could be running to and um, how uh, you can use the tools to help you move through that. Nice. Now, an EOS implementer, you know, sometimes there's some uh, uh, confusion between what an implementer does and what an integrator does, but from the implementer's perspective, you know, when a, a when an organization or a company is having those types of problems that you you just mentioned, you know, talk about some of the things that an EOS implementer brings to the table. Yeah, first and foremost, uh, where your coach, your facilitator, and guide through the journey, and uh, what that is is just an outside perspective taking you through this so that everyone on your team can fully participate. And uh, you can do it yourself. And it just takes the person who is on the team will have to facilitate instead. So they're not 100% uh, participating within uh, the process as much if they're an implementer. And uh, the clarity and focus that you gain uh, is through a lot of the questions that a facilitator or coach would ask throughout the process. Uh, next, there's accountability. So some teams really just need to commit to showing up and being somewhere offsite uh, regularly and having that person uh, be there and get them to that place and through the day. So just the accountability of committing to the offsites and being there uh, helps move things along as well. Because it's easy to be in your day to day and not do it and say, okay, well, we all can't go. Let's just push it to next week or uh, we can skip this quarterly. Uh, so it, it definitely happens to the best of us, right? So uh, problem solving, putting together a uh, framework for solving through things and uh, keeping things on track. So having someone who's not in the weeds of your day to day uh, to help facilitate the problem solving. Well, cool. Yeah. You know, having worked with several different businesses, there are some tips and tools and techniques 
from a professional implementer standpoint. Um, can you talk through a couple of those that you can offer? Yeah, absolutely. So one big one that I uh, mentioned earlier is not really tr giving it a full attempt, uh, really going all in on it. Mm -hmm. So when you pick something like this, it affects pretty much everyone in the organization. So just picking something, even if it's not this system and really trying it is what's going to best set you up for success. Yes. Because some people will say, hey, we, we tried this, but it, it didn't really work. And I'll ask them some questions. They might say, well, like, we didn't we didn't have level 10 meetings every week and we didn't really update our vision. Or we didn't we didn't pass it out to anybody. So it's just really going all in with it to to make sure that um, you've really tried it to apply the tools. And it's a lot easier said than done. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, got it. And I, I like the idea of what you mentioned about, you know, sharing it with everyone in the organization, because, you know, everyone needs to know where we're going, not just what we're doing day to day to, to get there. Yes, absolutely. And then another big one is actually looking at your tools regularly. So looking at your VTO uh, frequently, because some teams will um, do it, put in the hard work to set it up and then not look at it regularly. And then so it's easy to get distracted by the shiny objects in between that time. And uh, it really helps to to reorient yourself. And if you're doing those frequent level tens, it will take you back to the VTO. What are your rocks off track? And uh, it'll really help with that. And then that leads me to the next one. Look at your rocks regularly. Make sure you're doing the level 10 meetings where you're checking up on the status of the rocks and solving through rocks that are stuck. I like it. I like it. Let's see if we can move forward a bit. Now, when do you need to ask for help? Like if someone is out there and they're, they're struggling, um, you know, when is the best time? When do you need an implementer? Yeah, so uh, there are a couple things to look for if the do it yourself is just not working for you. Um, some some owners will try to um, implement it themselves and then they're also working on the day to day and they aren't able to participate fully. Let's say when you're trying to do a quarterly or have a full day session. Um, or you just find that it's it's frustrating you for any of those reasons we talked about earlier. Um, not having an outside perspective or feeling like you haven't really gotten a grasp of the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, another reason is that maybe you you do want a fresh perspective to to ask and challenge the team where maybe they might be um, not noticing that uh, you're not looking deeply enough or not getting to root issues or really not challenging people to say what's really on their minds. So it's uh, for this to work, you have to be open and honest and really be okay with addressing uncomfortable things. So having an outside person highlight those types of things and facilitate the conversation can be helpful. And uh, even if you do self-implementation, there are so many resources available and Ray and I are here to help you as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about the other side, which is the integrator role. And if you're not familiar, the integrator is someone who runs the day-to-day -day operations. So you don't have to. And let's explore that a little bit more. So what if I'm feeling like this? You know, what if you're feeling overwhelmed, bogged down in the day-to-day -day operational tasks? You know, or if you feel like we could do better, maybe productivity has slid, um, or, or things are getting more complex. There's some organizations that are growing, they're building, and the operations have gotten so complex that managing it is really taking your energy away from being the visionary and being the leader and owner of the business who's taking it to where you see your vision going to and part of that vision is buy-in you may notice that people in your organization don't have the same buy-in that you have they don't follow through with commitments they don't 
uh, deliver as well as you would expect. And sometimes you're left with excuses or, or finger pointing. He did this, she did that. And that can become overwhelming. And one of the key reasons why organizations stop doing the things that Tiffany was talking about in, in their EOS journey is because they just get overwhelmed. They get fed up with doing this day to day and they let things slide. So an integrator is that person who comes in and helps you when you just don't want to do it yourself. Um, or maybe the solution you have isn't working. Uh, we, we've seen that before where there's someone who's been appointed to that role, but maybe they're in the wrong seat, quite honestly, or maybe they just need coaching or training in how to be operator for your company or chief operating officer officer for your company. Tiffany, we were looking at these earlier and talking about what can an implementer do for your, I'm sorry, what can an integrator <laughs> do for your business? And I remember the number one thing we came out with, it was, you know what, it's LMA. And if you're not familiar with that term, that's leadership, management, and accountability. Um, it's supporting the team with day-to-day -day actions that help them um, focus on the business, and it enables the owner to go out and do other things besides worrying about these day to day tasks. You know, each day people are doing work and it's cross across different functions in your company. Maybe you have sales, um, you have uh, packaging, you have shipping, you have customer service and all of these different verticals need to be aligned and rowing in the same direction to make sure the business is is operating the, the way it can the way it should. So an integrator can help to drive that operational alignment across functions, um, make sure that it follows your vision, that it's according to your core values, and it has milestones where we're reaching your organizational goals and, and letting you know about it. Um, and the last one on this is culture. Like this shouldn't be something that is just a one time, one time through it. We, we get uh, a product out the door or we done one time. But there has to be a culture of excellence and where people want to do what's necessary to win and they uh, hold themselves accountable to actually deliver in the organization. Now, a couple of things I wish I had known earlier or if I could talk to business owners and let them know here's some things that you probably um, should consider or if you haven't considered really think about. Uh, first one is being savvy about financing. Uh, as small business owners, there's so many creative ways to fund your business um, that will, even if you're bootstrapping, there's ways to supplement that bootstrapping and do that early. Uh, another tip is hire professionals early, especially for things you're not that good at. Um, taxes, or if it's running operations, or you know whatever it is for things that you're not that great at, marketing, uh, sales, revenue generation, hire professionals early to help create processes so you're not hiring some later to clean up things that you may have done later. Um, what got you here won't get you there. You probably need to look at something different to get to the next level, and it, it might require a change. Organizations are always transforming. Um, tools. At the level where you need an integrator, an integrator should be able to use your tools to manage your organization appropriately. There has to be some type of sales management or sales funnel tool. Like how do you bring leads and go through the sales process? And you know if that's integrated or working along with customer relationship management, how do you manage customers once they go from being a lead to a customer? And then progress management. Once you do have sales and customers, how do you manage the progress of when you start with the customer to the end where they're satisfied with your service? Mm -hmm. Last on this list is, is techniques, platinum rule over golden rule. If you haven't seen that before, platinum rule just states, treat others the way they want to be treated, not necessarily the way you want to be treated. So follow the platinum rule. And that may mean bringing in other tools. Um, you know, earlier, Tiffany mentioned Colby Index, or uh, DISC or Emergenetics, there's tons of tools out there, but get something to learn more about your style of thinking and other styles of thinking so you can <clears throat> use that platinum rule. Use a simple variable pay structure for all employees. You know, make it where if people do 
amazing, outstanding work, that there is amazing, outstanding reward for them. Um, and lastly, fail fast, fail small, and embrace the results. Um, don't be afraid to take some risk, especially as a small business owner. Let's try some things, but try it small. Let's not have a huge uh, six month failure. Let's have a, a one week failure, <laughs> a small fail, and learn from it and move forward. <laughs> uh, I did want to show this uh, image I had in here because I just think it's kind of fun. And when you think about the three roles that we've talked about today, we've talked about a visionary who is obviously the CEO, the owner of the business. And we've talked about an integrator. And we also talked about an implementer. And I use this old Batman comic to, to, to articulate it. And actually, I'm, I'm not great at coming up with Batman type of language. So I asked ChatGPT to write me some statements as Batman if he were a, a visionary for an EOS business. And here's what it says, in the darkest of nights, I see the dawn of possibilities where I have a vision for the business. Um, so even it kind of understands like, you know, how these particular roles uh, support each other. And we see, um, if you think about uh, Batman and you see Alfred here at the bottom, he's the one that gives them all the cool tools and the car and the plane and all the, the things on the belt. So without the three of them working together, we usually say dynamic duo, but it's really a dynamic trio of them working together to have the vision, implement the right tools, and integrate the right day-to-day -day processes for organizations to be successful. Love it, so creative. So for more information on these, I did wanna uh, bring this up again. Uh, you know, Tiffany, for people who are coming to this particular session and people who contact you, tell me some of the things that you have available for them and what goes on in a 90 minute meeting. Yeah, absolutely. So a 90 minute meeting is a complimentary meeting and a, a learning session with uh, a team that's wanting to find out more about EOS. So you basically get a much more in-depth introduction to the model and the process and the tools. And uh, it's where you get a feel for, okay, is this something we do want to commit to? Because that's, like I said, it's a, a really big indicator of whether it's successful or not. And uh, we figure out if there's um, if it's a good fit for the organization. And even if you decide, oh, OK, well, we don't know yet, you get the, all these tools coming out of it that you can apply immediately. And then um, I have ebooks that I'm happy to send for uh, the leadership team to start using immediately. And if you're interested in a, a copy of the book Traction or something else from the EOS library, please let me know. I'm happy to send you a copy on me. All right. Thank you very much. And on my side, you can set up a free and confidential consultation. Um, you know, sometimes these are sensitive matters for business owners, especially if there's someone who's incumbent in the role. Um, I can give you tips on how to train and coach that person to become a better integrator within your company. Or if you're looking for fractional integrator services, either myself or people from a, a firm I'm associated with, GCE Strategic Consulting, has several uh, professional integrators that can help you to drive your day-to-day -day operations in your business. And also for uh, attending today, um, you know, connect with me, set up a, a session. I also have some free ebook downloads, things that help small business owners. And I'd love to send you a copy of the Four Dimensional Manager. Um, it's something that helped me to understand my thinking style and to compare it to others in organizations I work with and to be sure that I'm applying the platinum rule of or how do people want to be treated versus how I want to be treated. And so I can offer that as well. So I love that. Um, want to say thanks for joining us today. Um, Tiffany, any parting thoughts for us on this lovely morning? I do. I have a couple questions that people have asked me recently that I would love to hear your thoughts on. And um, and then also if Carter and Kathleen have anything to ask. Uh, 
first off, um, some people are still confused by the idea of implementer versus integrator. Even you know we've um, touched on it through throughout this. And usually, I tell them just the quick shortcut is, I'm the person you see once a quarter uh, to reorient the vision and dig through IDS um, for the tough issues and learn new tools. And then usually I say the integrators in the day-to-day, -day, the glue that holds everything together to make that plan a reality on a day-to-day. -day. Would you add anything to that? You know, I, I like that. Um, there have been times when someone has come to me and they, they would say, I need an operating officer. I need a chief operating officer or I need an integrator. And the state of their business or you know, where they are in their journey, it, it isn't quite there for me to, to, to come in and operate anything yet. And I'll, I'll just be honest with them and tell them, it's, you're not ready for an integrator yet. You don't really have established processes and you know, ways of delivering value. Like I would be there, I'd, I'd be floundering for a while without you know, something to build upon. Um, so I always advise, people to you know, make sure you've worked with someone to help you to implement those those tools and those tools that meet your core values that meet your vision and, and that you have some defined objectives that you're trying to reach over time and, and some big hairy audacious goals that you know would would make it seem like you've really really been successful um, so you know I, I try to make sure that people understand have a some clarity between what these two distinct roles offer and how they can be successful with one or the other. Now, vice versa, somebody calls me and say, I have a great process to set up. I need someone to come in here and operate this so I can go and launch the next wave of our business. That's when you mean someone is a fractional basis to come in and do the operations. Of it. That's really helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that I get recently is that um, our managers can't manage. Um, it's stressing us out, and uh, the talent pool is really tough right now. Um, just getting just getting people in the door is hard. So realistically, um, what would be the first thing um, as an integrator coming into an organization, and you spoke about how LMA is so crucial in an integrator role, I 100% agree. What would you suggest to teams that are dealing with that right now? Because it is hard to find you know, amazing people right now. And um, what would you tell people? You know, there's a, a skill set that I think that a good integrator should have, and it's leading without authority. Because you may not necessarily be brought in as the authority figure. Um, most of the times when I've done change management at organizations, I was simply brought in as a coach, a silent observer. I would sit amongst a room of other practitioners, and I would make suggestions on, based on what I saw. And those suggestions added value. So he started asking me for more of my suggestions. And I started offering them. And I said, well, will you give us a training class? OK, I'll give some training classes. Well, will you put together some cadences for us to do this on a Sure, I'll, I'll do that. So you, I think an integrator has to build trust with the organization that you can add value, not that you're there because of your authority. It's a big difference, um, in, especially coming into a smaller organization where other people may have been working there for, for a year or more. And when you come in as a, a newbie, you're a new person, you're a new addition to the team, it's, it's paramount that you build that trust by showing value of what you bring to the table. That's really important, yes. Uh, do Carter, Kathleen, or anyone else have any questions? Feel free to put it in the chat. Um, otherwise, I have a couple more questions that have come up recently. I would love to hear Ray's thoughts on. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, another one is also as an integrator. How, some people say, "Oh, I can, um, 
I'm almost the thought partner for the visionary. And oftentimes visionaries need a sounding board, a place for their ideas. And um, how would you how would you give advice to uh, people who are trying to shape that relationship? Like they're not quite used to navigating that yet. Let's say a company does have someone who has a visionary style and um, really is a, a, a true visionary and then someone who's an integrator and trying to be a sounding board for that person. How, what have you seen work well? Great question. Um, you know, one big thing, and it's an EOS technique, is the same page meeting. Um, how can we make sure on a regular basis that we're on the same page? And it really takes the visionary and the integrator um, having a relationship where they can be completely and truly honest with one another. No, holds, no holding back. You may have to be really, truly honest with one another and take time to really hear and understand one another. Um, oftentimes, the visionary may see something that doesn't exist because it's a vision. That's, that's the whole title of the, you know, the, the role, it's a visionary, they see things. Yeah. And the integrator is looking at processes and how do we take that vision and, and operationalize it or turn it into reality every day. And, and sometimes the two don't match and, and there should be that little bit of a, a discourse between the two. They shouldn't always just agree because the integrator is going to look at that vision and test it or challenge it. And said, well, you know, how can I break that into pieces that myself and the team can execute and deliver value on each day, each increment, you know, every week, every two weeks, whatever we're, we're measuring. And the visionary may have a different view of what progress looks like, and they may not see value in all of the day to day things that you're doing as an integrator. So having those same page meetings, being brutally honest with one another and um, able to um, have candid conversations uh, about where the business is going, about your perception of where the business is going, um, and, and not being afraid to be a bit vulnerable, because sometimes your, your vision, someone may not be able to operationalize it. Like, I don't know how to make that come true. Um, and you know, being honest and able to make your thoughts visible, like, can we draw it out together? And we use things like design thinking to where we just iterate and build something in a, a, a few minutes that's a prototype. So I, I think using those types of, of things helps to make sure you're on the same page and uh, delivering together. Yeah, that's very helpful. I love that tool. Uh, and yeah, the, it has to have that brutal honesty in that component because um, if a visionary and integrator are talking and they just miss each other, the rest of the organization feels it completely. Um, so there's a lot of potential for chaos to happen. Um, my last question would be on the flip side of that. Sometimes um, I have teams where the visionary and the integrator is the same person. Uh, and uh, for whatever reason, sometimes uh, it, they just don't, they don't have an integrator or that visionary has a capability to be an integrator and they, they like it, um, at least for now. Any tips for that type of uh, situation where a visionary and integrator are the same individual? They're the same person. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I had a conversation with someone recently uh, about this. And when they're the same person, you, you have to realize that they're going to conflict with each other sometimes. Yeah. And it's the same person. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to create some inner conflict. Uh, imagine uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in the same individual. You know, one person with the attitude that Steve Jobs had and one with the attitude of Steve Wozniak. It, it's difficult to have the big vision and to push forward with something that is, uh, is visionary and to also be grounded in day to day grind that creates that vision. So I would say it, it takes sometimes some tools to to help you to to do that or even to remember the cadences that are necessary um checklists i use a lot of checklists because I'm, i may have a vision that's 10 steps ahead but i don't want to go from step one 
to step 10 or one to seven to 10. I mean, need to go one, two, three, four, and so forth. So having a checklist, even if you've done this a thousand times, to remember what are the steps that I need to do in order to um, run day-to-day -day operations or in order to get value out of a one-week increment or two-week increment. You know, what are the different meetings we need to have? How do those meetings need to be conducted? What is the output that needs to come out of those meetings? Um, how, do we, how do we update scorecards to know who's making what progress on what each day? Um, you know, how do we make that easier for each person? So those, all of those questions can sometimes, they can escape a visionary because the, the visionary may be looking at the big picture and not looking at all those little things. So make some checklists, use your tools. If you have tools like 90IO or, or Bloom or some of these other, other um, tools that work with EOS, they have reminders and, and all kinds of little um, automations that can set up some of these things for you in advance that can help you if you don't remember to, to do them, or if you are focused on the vision and you miss some of those things. Um, so never stop doing L level 10 meetings because you forgot. So <laughs> if you automate it and you set it up, it's automatically there and someone's gonna be there to um, make sure that value is coming out of that. I think we have a, a, a question. Yes. Who does an integrator, uh, or ha uh, might be how does an integrator handle processes that can change several times per year and result in a redesign of processes? Marketing would be a good example that um, of processes that can change frequently. Great, great question. Um, I like to use small increments in my meeting pulse. So in, in EOS, there's a, a meeting pulse of how often are we going to, to meet? And one of the things that I always add into my meeting posts is a retrospective or a reflection. So if we're having a, a, a two week meeting post where we, we meet um, on a you know, consecutive basis, one of those meetings, we're going to look back at what are all the goals that we set out to achieve over the last two weeks? And how did we do? And knowing what we know now, two weeks later, what would we have done differently? So that helps to shape and guide your solution um, because those things that you come out with at the end of that retrospective, they become action items for your next planning session. So when you plan for the next two weeks, you're taking into account what you learned in the last two weeks. So with marketing, marketing is going gonna, is gonna to change. Maybe, maybe there's a, you know, different targets or um, time of year when, when things change and you need to adjust. So planning often is a good thing you don't want to skip planning and you don't want to skip out on the learnings that you get from short increments um, no good to do this every six months because it's too late you know so much has gone by so much risk has, has gone by but if you take a two-week approach reflect make action items adjust your your plan and continue to move forward in your traction you have no challenges there yeah, that's a really great question. It's a it's a hard one because uh, marketing a good marketing requires a lot of testing and mm -hmm. uh, repeated testing to make sure things are working. So I would say it's a completely a combination of that and also pre planning. So a lot of teams have an annual marketing uh, plan for the year, right? And then within that, if you're running a lot of campaigns, and you definitely have to be nimble and do everything that like Ray just recommended for sure. So I think all of those things work in conjunction with each other. And it's definitely about breaking out who can, um, who should uh, and can handle the, uh, like the short term change of the processes to, to be good, uh, to actually be effective in marketing. Very true. Tiffany, we, one word that we hear a lot in corporate America is change management. Mm -hmm. and I've worked in a lot of change management for organizations and a big part of it is making people ready for change or change hardiness, as they would say. Because organizations know they have to change, they have to adapt, and they have to do it quickly. So versus it being something that's really disruptive and personally impactful, they want to make change as small and make people embrace it and 
uh, and understand and expect it so that when change happens, it's not a big surprise. It's not we're thrown off and the whole business is in disarray. It's, oh, th there's an adjustment. We do this all the time. We'll learn from what, last, what we did last time. We'll learn what went well, what didn't go so well, and we'll make action items and we'll adjust. If you, if you keep that mindset going and keep doing those repetitions, this process wins. Absolutely, yeah, and, and change is so, um, it's just a lot of communication, right? Uh, as one major aspect of it is like over communicating, making sure people know it's coming, when it's happening, and, and recapping what just happened. So it's definitely a big part of the process. What uh, closing thoughts or questions um, are on your mind, Ray? Well, um, from talking to different business owners, I think that waiting is you know, something that impacts a lot of people. Um, thinking that things are gonna get better, thinking that um, things will just change, they'll go back to the way they used to be. Yeah. I don't think that's going to happen. And I, I think that savvy business owners should take action and um, start to implement some, some new things to make your business change ready. And um, if, if you are at a place where you say that, you know what, I don't have the processes in place that I need in order to even operate most efficiently, then talk to an implementer to, to help you to at least choose a process or understand the different variables of what process is needed. And, and if you do have a good process in place and you're looking for someone to run the day-to-day -day operations, so you can get out of it and go close big accounts or open a new branch or new market, new product you want to launch, then great, then do it earlier than later. Don't wait for the ideal perfect candidate to show up at your doorstep, but bring someone in to at least structure the organization the way it should be and to start running it, start getting value out of it. Um, that way, when you do find that ideal person, that ideal integrator or COO for your company, they're ready to come in and hit the ground running, not hit the ground trying to figure out what do I do next. Yeah, it's, it's a really, really important point. And I would say um, it, a, a lot of people struggle with continually, like, how do I know these are the right people for our organization? And a lot of that work um, people struggle with, oh, do I bring on that full-time team member and, and start this process of change after I've brought on a couple key hires? Or do I think about all this first? And I'm interested to hear what you think as well, Ray, is that it, I would say if you don't set out what kind of um, people you're attracting, then there's a higher chance that you're going to attract people that you don't intend to during that hiring um, and applicant um, screening process. So really doing the deep work to dig into your core values, where you want to go as an organization. Um, some people might say, oh, I want to wait for that full-time um, operations person to be here first. Having all of that info um, to share with the applicant is so exciting for them. So I, I want to definitely uh, see what you have to say about that too, Ray. Well, most definitely. It gives us some food for thought for our next session on this. Mm -hmm. We're just about out of time for, for today. Um, and we've got a lot more to share. Um, you know, Tiffany and I are you know, going to be working together more to um, help bring good knowledge out to people in the business community. Um, I'm here in North Las Vegas, she's in Southern California, and you know, we would love to meet with you and talk more about your business. And if there's ways that we can help you or point you in the right direction, we'd love to do so. so Thank you so much for joining. Tiffany, thank you so much for, for bringing your Thanks knowledge. For me. And we will see you guys again, maybe in 30 days. Yeah, see you soon. Thank you for the questions. Bye, everyone. <laughs>